Hey guys, Ryan Bailey for Charlotte FC. This is Between Two Pints, and joining me today, returning champion, our academy manager, Dan Locke. Dan, good day to you, sir. How are you? Morning, Ryan. I'm great, thanks. How are you doing? Very good indeed. All the better for having a chat with you today, Dan. We're talking about all things academy today. Can you explain to start off with why an academy program is important for an MLS team and why specifically for Charlotte FC as well? Yeah, so, so I, I would say an academy program is important on a couple of levels. I think, first of all, the importance of, of the connection with the fans and the community, first and foremost. If you look along across the MLS academies now and the MLS first teams, you see an, an ever growing number of homegrown players. And I think that really helps connect with the fans, uh, the community as a whole. And, and not only obviously in MLS, but also across you know, the top, top leagues in the world. I think fans can always identify with a player that's come from their hometown, that's come through the ranks. It increases more excitement, more buzz around the club. And then you would say as well, a big, a big role of the academy is helping within the roster build of a first team, the rules surrounding the salary cap, how homegrown players impact that, um, allocation of money. We don't have uh, three hours to go over all the rules, but it's very important. <laughs> And, and then also with sustainability for a club, we've recently seen uh, Busio from Kansas City go to uh, Venezia in Italy for a big transfer fee. And now that means that club can use that transfer fee to, to further um, you know, impact the infrastructure of the club. The investment can go back into the club to, to grow the club even further. So I think that's a big role as well long term when you start developing players and have the potential maybe to, to you know, move them on and sell them as well. Fantastic stuff. The Academy, Dan, in its sophomore year now, how did year one go for you? We were really proud of year one uh, amidst uh, a pandemic and, and a brand new club and brand new academy. You know, between the, the months of March 2020 and, and June 2020, there was only about three staff. There was me and Mark Nichols and we'd spend uh, most of our days walking up and down the trail, planning, strategy of um, what we could do. Um, and so to launch the academy in July with two teams and, and, a, and a really great group of staff was very, um, very exciting. We were something we were really proud of. So year one went really well. We were very proud of, of being able to launch the Discovery program and the connection we built there with uh, the local clubs. Uh, obviously, it was a big highlight in taking the under 17 to under 17s to playoffs and then making the last 16. I think we believe that was a good achievement, and it laid a real good foundation in terms of standards we expect within the academy. Uh, the culture we want to create and also little things like the playing style, playing identity. So it laid a really good foundation for, for year two. A lot of progress made then, Dan. Any big lessons you took away from year one or any surprises? I would, I would say the, the big thing is really the importance of recruitment. That is massive. You know, if you want to be, if you're going to be a top academy and produce place for a first team, you really have to get your recruitment right and and build those connections with the local community, the local clubs, those relationships, and be looking at, at all different levels of play for top players. Now we've recruited players from some of the big clubs, we've recruited some some top players from the smaller clubs and smaller leagues. So I would say the, the the big lesson going into year two is continue that recruitment, continue to get out with the local community. That's why we've adjusted our structure a little bit and, and hired head of recruitment, um, Chipsa, who will oversee that department and grow it out. Um, and we'll continue to do that in year two and, and make sure we find the very top talent in the in the Carolinas and giving young players um, opportunity. Chips is on board, as you say there, Dan. Who else is on board for the second season? We've expanded things, haven't we? Yeah, we've, we've hired three three new staff. We have Bruno joining us as Academy Operations, Brian Scales as under 14 coach, uh, Jorge Herrera and Alex Martinez, they were with us last year, but they've now moved in, into more full-time coaching roles with, with Alex being more involved in the coaching in the academy and Jorge is under 15 coach. And obviously Chipsa as our head of recruitment. So the staff have grown, we're very excited with that. Brian Edwards has also come on in a full-time role with us now, which is huge for the goalkeeping department. And then in terms of the growth of the academy, we've added a, a third team as we've publicised, so 14s, 15s and 17s. We now have 56 players, which is um, an increase on, uh, I think we had just under 40 last year. And within that 56, 30, 32 of those players are brand new. So we have to integrate those new players in, integrate them with our standards, our, our, teach them how we want to play. But it's definitely growing, it's very exciting. 
And now as we look ahead to, to this year, the, the first team staff joining us in January, we've also already had the pleasure of having Miguel come out and present to the academy staff. He was in uh, some of our pre-season meetings with the academy staff. Christian Latancio was out at training a few weeks ago. So that integration from the academy to the first team is really exciting, and we're looking forward to that, to, you know, continuing to grow. Wow, and a big variation in terms of the opponents this season as well, Dan. We've got, got some road games which will require some flights, going to Montreal, Toronto, uh, up to New York. Um, how important are those kind of games in a player's development, and how similarly are they treated in, uh, to a first team? Is, is it approached the same way? Yeah, definitely. The, the experience of being away in a hotel, traveling, up and down the East Coast is really important for the players because it's preparing them for what life will be like as a first team player. So often we'll, we'll we maybe leave for travel on a Friday afternoon or we'll fly um, on a weekend to, to the different locations. In terms of our schedule within the MLS Next League, we now will participate in an MLS Next Only, sorry, an MLS Only League where we'll play just MLS teams. We'll play out of our games this season. We'll play 27, a minimum of 27 games only against MLS opponents, uh, as well as seven games against non MLS in an intra league cup competition. And then we'll also participate in the Generation Adidas Cup in the late fall and spring, and then playoffs um, next June and July. So the level of competition has definitely increased for us this year. It provides the players with better competition, the highest level level of competition in the country. And um, if we have aspiring players for a first team, we have to push them outside the comfort zone and give them top games. Hypothetical for you, um, plenty of ex-pros on Charlotte FC's technical staff. If those ex-pros face the under-17 team, what would happen? Who would win? Bear in mind we've got players uh, or ex-players like Darius Barnes, like Ryan Johnson, former less players. We've got Jorge Herrera, Mikel Antia, who played in Spain, Patrick Dacca, lots and lots of ex-pros. How would it go down? I think that it'd start with a lot of enthusiasm. Then it'd um, move into a few probably hamstring strains <laughs> and uh, calf strains. Probably take a 1-0 lead and then park the bus and um, rely on uh, agent experience maybe. But um, I think you look at the under 70s now and, and the speed they play at and the energy, it's, um, it might look, might look like everyone could still compete, but it'd be a difficult game, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm quite sure. Dan, an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you so much. One last question for you. I want to know the proudest moment of your time at Charlotte FC so far. I would say the, the, the stadium games last October. As I said, we started the process back in March, Mark Nichols and I, in terms of starting to build the academy. So to get, you know, seven months in and be able to play in the stadium with around 2,000 fans and then that day be a real collective effort for, for the whole club. You know, everything from the stadium operations, the media team, uh, our owner was there watching the game, executive staff, the fan groups, the families, it was a real proud collective moment and and also the games are entertaining it, it, we put on a great event so I, I would say that it really we, we, we kind of took a step back on the field that day and thought wow we've achieved we've been able to achieve something um, special as a foundation uh, this is just the beginning obviously and we're looking forward to many more moments in the future like that so so that was a real proud moment and, and also uh, just the, you know the achievement also of, of the 17s for those boys being able to go to playoffs and and, and make playoffs last year I think that was a real uh, real fun proud moment for the players because we have to remember this is about the players so I think the things like the stadium event which, uh, you know qualifying for playoffs their their memories that'll last with them for a lifetime so those those are two big proud moments for us definitely they were great moments and and a bright future for the program dan lock thank you so much for joining me today cheers thanks ryan cheers mate